Lightest Curiosity Closet. On today's show, we're going to be looking at biology and physiology and lots of cool science stuff from Bret Hart High School. We have a really cool guest with us today, Mrs. Maurer. Hey, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Allie. Oh, no problem. So, I'm curious, were you always a science teacher or did you teach something else when you started out? I actually have always been some kind of teacher, but not always a science teacher. I taught preschool and uh, worked with after, in an after school program for about 10 years before I taught high school. And how long have you been teaching? I've been at Bret Hart here for about nine years, but I've been teaching high school about 13 years. What made you want to become a teacher? Well, I just wor love working with others. I've always loved school. I've enjoyed helping others, and um, I loved babysitting. It was one of my top jobs. I just work well with kids, enjoy kids a lot. And so, um, and I'm very curious. I was with a kid in the class that asked questions constantly. They're like, oh, she's asking another question. That was me. And so with all my curiosity and loving uh, young people, it just worked out perfectly. Now, how did you get up from high school? How did you get up to high school? You started off at a younger age of teaching, and then you moved your way up. Now, what made you want to do that? Well, unfortunately, um, you don't, there's not a lot of pay in preschool teaching. I think that it's, um, it's unfortunate. It's, I, I think our country is kind of backwards when it comes to how we pay our teachers. Uh, but because you don't make a lot of money as a preschool teacher, it was going to be hard to make a living. I had been doing it for about 10 years. I was still making $8 an hour. And so I decided to go back to school, and I studied um, ornamental horticulture. I already had a psychology degree. Actually, it was my first degree. And, um, and then one teacher said to me, I was taking a, a, a zoology class. He was an awesome teacher, Ben Hawkins at College of the Redwoods. And he said, hey, have you thought about teaching biology in high school? And I said, no, because I was just looking for something else to do since I wasn't making much of a living. And I had thought about environmental education because I love to be outdoors and love students. But that just wasn't working out easily. I was trying to find programs. And, and when he said that, I said, wow, that seems neat. And I researched it. I was up in Humboldt County. And I ended up getting my biology degree from Humboldt State University and then my biological sciences teaching credential. Wow, um, that sounds like it was a lot of work. <laughs> And I hear a lot of students say that you're their mentor, they look up to you. Did you have a mentor while you were working on following your dreams and getting this awesome career? <laughs> well, I'd have to say that I probably had several. I come from a small family. I was raised by just my mother, but she's an amazing woman. She was always there for me. She, was very, she is a very strong woman. Um, into education. It's funny, a lot of kids um, think about going to college. Well, for me, it was never a thought. Of course you go to college. What else would you do? I didn't even know there was something else. And so she, with her love of the world, very positive, happy, go-getter, um, worked full time, loved her work. She was in science. She's a nurse. And so she was definitely one of my greatest mentors. Yeah. Now, how do you become a biology teacher? What kind of education does that take? Does that take a really long time? Or? No, it doesn't actually take a long time. What you need, first of all, is to have a biology degree. So that's a, a four-year degree, a bachelor's. And then you need to go through the credential program, or you can take a test. There's a couple ways of going about it. So actually, I have over 10 years of education because I love everything. I just told you I went to school for a long time. I went to San Francisco State University and uh, Humboldt State University, College of the Redwoods, and Ryder University, setting various things. But if you just want to, you know for sure you want to be a science teacher, then you can just uh, get the biology degree and do a credential program, which would take about five or six years. Does physiology require more education? No, it does not. Um, my biological sciences teaching credential, which I earned in, let's see, was that, I think it was, yeah, it was just a one-year program. It was a great program, too, at Humboldt State University. Um, allows me to teach any kind of biological science, which includes physiology, AP biology, anything in that realm. And then also, because it's called biological sciences, it kind of branches out a little bit, and I can also teach earth science and um, integrated science and some of the lower 
level physical sciences. So I'm a little curious, did anyone ever tell you you couldn't be a teacher, like, oh, you'll never make it or something like that? Um, I have to say not, and that's probably just because I've been such a driven person since I was a kid. <laughs> and um, I'm definitely the type of person, though, that loves the underdog and will always root for them. But I have to admit that I wasn't a very good student from an early age. I loved school. I was definitely not typical. Um, I came to class always curious, always wanting to learn, always wanting to do well. And so I did have a little dip in high school when uh, hormones went crazy, you know, went a little boy crazy. But uh, pre-high school and post-high school, I, again, was very much into my studies. And so I I was an excellent student. So no, I think most students knew if Sherry wants to do it, she'll do it. So you're teaching biology. What does the word biology mean? Because I know everyone talks about what it means, so I want everyone to know. <laughs> yes, it's important to know. And once you know, you have an idea of what it's about. So bio means life, and ology is the study of. So biology is the study of life. And we cover um, five topics. There's cell biology, and obviously about cells, because living things are made of one or more cells. And then there's genetics. Um, for example, I have here my prop, <laughs> a DNA model, for everybody can see real quick. I don't want to block everything. So this is pretty amazing. We are made from this genetic code, DNA. And there's only four bases. And then from those four bases, you get us, human beings, you get plants, you get bacteria, you get insects, and all that happens is just a little change in the genetic code from that tree and from you and me. And I think that's absolutely amazing, wonderful. Also, we study physiology, which is the study of the body systems. Um, and what else do we study? Ah, ecology, which is the study of organisms interacting with each other in their environment. For example, the skull. This is the skull of a coyote. And you can tell a lot from the form, tells you a lot about function. You can see these very pointy teeth. And these pointy teeth will tell you that, ah, it probably rips and tears flesh, which of course it does. Although form doesn't tell you everything, because interestingly enough, a coyote is an omnivore, which means that it eats both plants and animals. So it's kind of like, huh. That's interesting because it has such pointy teeth. Well, again, thing, depending on how creatures, oh, last topic, evolution, evolve over time, populations can change. And it turns out that coyotes went from just probably being meat eaters to also taking advantage of plants as well. What do you think is the most difficult like, topic you guys study for students to grasp onto? Well, I'd have to say most likely cell biology because it is so microscopic. And um, when you start getting into the nitty gritty, for example, I'll be teaching um, chapter five, which is the very end of the semester, is all about photosynthesis and cellular respiration, which is the study of how uh, our bodies make energy. And that gets so detailed and has all these acronyms like NADPH and all these weird things. And the kids are like, what the heck? Um, so in order to teach that, I used to teach that by, you know, showing little, um, clips of some a little animation and doing uh, lots of lecture and that's boring and, and nobody understood for the most part so I changed it and I became which I'm not much of a writer but I came at writer I direct and I wrote plays to teach the subject matter so Allie will know soon enough that uh, everybody has to be involved in the play not everybody has to sp have a speaking part but the students will actually act out photosynthesis and cellular respiration Oh, that sounds really complicated. Do you, how do you keep students interested like all year? It's like Monday, everyone's tired, they want to go home, and you've got to find a way to keep them interested. How do you right. do that? Well, one of the ways is because, as I'm sure you can probably see in the audience, can probably tell, is I'm a very energetic person. <laughs> I have tons of energy, and I love what I do. And so even if for some reason people are down and out, I'm usually not, and I have, if I have to jump up and down, if I have to shout, or even start doing jumping jacks, or run around the classroom, um, get everybody up and, and moving around, I'll do whatever it takes, um, besides the fabulous curriculum, which is fun, and the, and the labs we do, the hands-on curriculum, and the, and the different videos we'll watch, and besides the, that great stuff, I kind of become an actor myself. Well, how do you have so much energy? I mean, because every time I see you, you're just so energetic and you're happy. And I'm like, does she ever have a bad day? <laughs> well, yes. Like, like anybody else, I certainly do. However, um, who knows? It's just, uh, right? It's just in my 
genetic code. I don't know. Uh, it's just my, my disposition, my personality, that I love life and make the best of it, and I'm very blessed that I have a job that I enjoy. Now, what careers can you go into with biology? Goodness, you can go into just about every kind of science career there is because it's the foundation, you know, of, of life. So it branches into so many realms. I mean, you can go into genetics. There's a lot um, going on actually right now in the field of genetics, genetic engineering, all this. You might have heard about genetically modified organisms with our crops and different things like that, um, trying to... Uh, learn how to fight diseases through genetics as well and, and using viruses and, and all these. There's, there's so much out there in that field. But as a matter of fact, I was just at a conference and they spoke about how the top paying fields, um, most of them involve science. And, um, but there's computer science. There's so many different things they're talking about. Engineering, um, the physical sciences. Um, Working up at Big Trees National Park, being a forest, uh, forest ranger. There's so many different, and they all really the basic, would, a lot of them would be biology. Um, as well as, not only that, a lot of kids go, well, um, you know, so where's the money? So yeah, there's a fair amount of money in science. As well as those careers, there's about, about the top 20 careers that everybody, um, that they're looking for people to, to, to join these careers. Most of them are science careers. So if I were to say to somebody, what should you do? You know, I want to make some money. I want to have some fun. I'd say study science. So with biology and everything, do you think even if a student's looking at becoming a writer or something that doesn't involve science at all, do you think it's still important to take a science in high school? Oh, definitely. Because it broadens your horizons. For example, Allie, you're really into writing and communication. However, I've... Um, how do you think that we know what's going on in the world through communicators? So, for example, uh, Richard Preston, I don't know if you know him, but he's a very well-known science writer. And um, so I'm sure that he has someone of a love for science, but also wrote. And even if you don't love science, again, when you take a class about science, you're learning how the world works. And... Um, and, and learning how things work helps you think, helps your logic, getting a better understanding would certainly help any career. And it just sounds like it takes so much memorization. Do you have any tricks for students who <laughs> are like, oh God, look at all that vocabulary. How am I going to do that? Yeah, well, that, that is, can be very difficult. There's different kinds of tricks depending. Um, first of all, I do a lot of teaching about the, the root, the... Um, definitions of the roots of words. Because if you understand the roots, like we said bio, meaning life, that can really help you understand the vocabulary. Because if you have a word like anthropology or say archeology, span and it means nothing to you, right? How are you gonna remember that? But then if you learn, oh, archie means old or ancient, ah, the study of something ancient, it'll make more sense and it'll have a better, um, it'll stick in your mind better. So there's things like that, as well as um, sometimes people make up songs. Sometimes people take the, um, the first letter and make some kind of mnemonic. Um, there's different little tricks like that. First of all, you need motivation. You, want, you need to want to do it. And um, then you, these various techniques can help you. But it's true. It is like learning another language. I know that the hardest part for a lot of students, they said, was learning all the different parts of cells. Mm. Do you have a different way of like, you know, memorizing those? Because so, you may memorize the names, but you don't know where it is. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think, well, I've never actually come up with anything for the cells in particular because a lot of actually, now that you mention it, the parts of the cells, you don't really have to know exactly where they are. Um, so no, I can't give you any fast trick for that one, sorry. <laughs> so now the biology students have a trip coming up. Yes, um, I am in the works of planning a um, trip for any past or present biology students. And when I say that, the trip is actually 2015, spring break 2015. So that means the, the person, the student can be in biology next year or any time previous to that. And what it is, is I will take students um, through the organization Ecology Project International. We'll go to Baja, Mexico and we'll study and do data collection on invertebrates in the Sea of Cortez. It should be amazing. Uh, what we do um, is we go snorkeling and we actually um, find out how many, say, sea stars there are and sea cucumbers. 
Um, also on the agenda is swimming um, in a sea lion rookery, which should be amazing, uh, as well as sleeping on the beach under the stars in an island called Esporito. Oh, shoot. Am I going to forget the other name? Oh, now I am, and I don't want to mess up the Spanish. Um, but it's it just, I've seen pictures too, it's you know, just clear and gorgeous. We're gonna go and do some desert, um, learn some desert ecology, go in land, and there's supposed to be an amazing uh, waterfall. We get to swim under the waterfall. It should just be a trip of a lifetime, a trip that you would, I mean, life-changing. It could make you into a biologist. It could make you realize you don't want to be a biologist. But uh, you'll get to interact with local, um, uh, the local students, the Mexican students. It's going to be awesome. I took students last year to Costa Rica, and we studied the uh, leatherback sea turtle and got up in the middle of the night and went and helped uh, the moms, de not deliver, but we got the eggs and we put them in a safer spot because unfortunately there's poachers. And that was just amazing. I mean, the kids, I mean, how many people, there's actually not that many people on earth that get to actually touch uh, a leatherback sea turtle egg. And we were wearing gloves. Um, but I even got to do it. I let the kids do everything. And one night, they're so exhausted because you're up in the middle of the night doing this. Um, they're like, oh, Mrs. Mauer, you get to do it. And I was so excited. I actually, it was like 150 eggs. These turtles were as big as a small car. It was just an amazing experience. So I am definitely um, in search of lots of wonderful, uh, motivated science students and to come with me to, um, to Baja, Mexico. It, it does cost approximately $3,000, but you have, what, a year and a half or so to raise that money, and you work full-time in the summer? Hey, you can get that kind of money. So there is no like way to get financial support on this? Well, I... Um, I don't provide any. However, there are some, from what happened last time, for example, is not only did students get jobs, one or more jobs, but also students came up with some neat ideas. One student, she and her family gave a dinner and they actually sold a, a, you know, a, a plate for a certain amount of money. She had like 10 guests. So they did their own fundraising, but that was a really neat idea. Another one was a student had, her family had some friends who donated merchandise from their businesses and they had an auction. So there are a lot of really neat ideas that I would certainly help students with. Um, however, I found that planning um, uh, to do some kind of event to raise money was so time consuming and so hard when I already work, work full time that it's not just some, it's not something that I was able to do. But we found where there's a will, there's a way. And all these kids, you know, nobody just had anybody hand them 3,000 bucks. They either did these neat uh, ideas with their families or they worked and they earned that money. Now I have to ask this for all the parents who are watching this going, oh my god, my kid's going to be in biology next year and I don't know if I want them on this trip. <laughs> what are some of the safety precautions used for students when traveling? Um, I've seen some worries about Mexico and young girls. So anything for the parents? <laughs> yeah. Well, for, well, first of all, this trip, of course, is voluntary. And, and, and last year, I was lucky enough to get tw have 12 students go. Um, so nobody has to go. But I did have students from age 14 to 18, and they all thrived and did, and did fine and well. Now, as far as um, the research I've done to, f you know, because Mexico, there are lots of concerns about um, uh, violence and, and different things like that, is that this is such a remote location that we, they, have, they have never had any problems there, and that they don't foresee any because it is so remote. Um, and that this program, Ecology Project International, this group, they've been doing these different uh, trips, I think five different locations, for about 15 years, and they haven't had any problems as far as I know. Yeah, so it seems really safe and a wonderful event. I just had to ask that for oh, all the no, parents. Oh, no, I understand. <laughs> and kind of changing the subject onto physiology, what mm -hmm. does physiology mean? So word? physiology is the studies of the body, the study of the body's systems. So we're made of lots of different systems, like the nervous system and the um, circulatory system. So we have all these organs, and they work together um, to make us function. And so you actually zero in, it's human physiology, on those different systems and how they work. For example, right now in physiology, they're learning about the muscular system, and they're engaged in a project where they have to show visually and in a written paper how your muscles contract so that you can move. So do you know some of the sections it's broken up down into? Because it, you know, human body is like, it's not just a general thing. 
So right. what do they basically study over the course of a year? Well, there are, yes, there are a lot of systems, and we don't go through all of them at all. We start off, um, in general, learning nomenclature. Nomenclature means naming things. So they w learn all about um, how there's different names for different regions, and, um, and there's, so there's a lot of naming involved. And, and if you, which we do, dissect things, you have to learn about this kind of cut versus this kind of cut. They have different names, coronal cut, and so on and so forth. So, excuse me. Um, so we start off with nomenclature. Then we move on to, we do a little review of cell biology, because certainly all the organs are made up of cells. And then we move on to tissues. Tissues is a chapter where you learn about there's four major tissues in the body, epithelial and uh, connective and so on and so forth. And you learn about where they are and how they make up the organs and how they make up the body. Then we move on to the skeletal system and the muscular system. And the next semester we'll do the uh, senses and the nervous system. And oh, and of course, there's the cat. And the physiology is very famous for the cat. We will dissect a cat. We will get a cat that is has its fur, you know, fully just regular cat. Um, nobody goes out and hurts these cats. They are gotten through the, I, I believe the chemical company gets them through the Humane Society. Unfortunately, you know, there's not enough home for cats, so they've been put down. And um, the kids do everything. They skin them, and they learn about that connective tissue right there because skin is connected to the muscle. And then they learn about many of the kinds of muscles and we're very similar to cats, so it, it works out nicely. Uh, cats and we have muscles, humans and cats have a lot of the same muscles and so we go through muscles. And they actually take off the muscles of the cats in certain uh, arm area and in the leg area and we look at the bones. So we go through and we, we really delve into that cat. And then of course inside. And we look at and the interior organs are really neat because they are very much like ours. And so there you go, you can see the heart, you can see the lungs and, and right there in front of you. It's, it's amazing and, and I love the uh, vessels, looking at the, uh, the carotid arteries and the aorta. It's just to me, just an amazing thing. And uh, the kids enjoy it and get freaked out. But I always remind them, beginning of the semester, if you don't want to dissect a cat, you probably shouldn't take this class. Um, so we spend about a month and they learn a lot. We kind of integrate the systems uh, with the cat and we end the, that semester uh, learning about the digestive system. Well, that sounds like an awesome experience, but dissecting a cat isn't an optional thing. It's a yeah, I have it. It pretty much is. I mean, I, I tell kids at the beginning of the semester that, like I said, that they shouldn't take it if they really want to dissect a cat. If for some reason something happened and they were still in the course and they really didn't think they could do it, we probably could figure out some kind of virtual arrangement. Um, I just don't think that that's the best way to learn, but we probably could figure out a virtual lab or something like that. Um, have you ever, do you guys dissect frogs? We actually don't. Um, biology doesn't have any dissection in it. When I came to teach at Bret Hart, I believe they were dissecting fetal pigs. But then I felt that there wasn't a, there, most students weren't getting anything out of it. They were either grossed out or they were being very disrespectful. So I took the dissection out of biology and I felt, uh, I'm, I am the only biology, I was the only biology teacher this year, uh, someone's teaching a couple uh, periods as well. And, and I decided, you know what, if a student really wants to dissect something, then they'll take an upper division science course like physiology. They'll be motivated to do it, they'll know it's coming, and um, that's the way it's not, because biology is, is basically a requirement for college, but physiology is not. So if you're taking physiology, you know how you have to dissect things. You're motivated to do it. You want to do it. And so there's a, there's a bunch. There's not just the cat, but we dissect a cow's eye, a sheep heart, and a sheep brain. And so the kids know it's coming. They're ready for it, or they wouldn't take the course. Wow, that sounds terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are some of the safety precautions that are used during dissecting something? Because that sounds a little scary. You've got all these hormonal high school students <laughs> with all these sharp objects. Well, again, for the most part, I just remind students that they need to be calm and mature. Um, but these are usually older students. They're usually juniors and seniors that are a little bit more um, Control of, them, control of themselves, right? They uh, have a little bit more uh, understanding of what's required of them and how to act. However, I am always watchful of, of course, the sharp objects. And yes, there are scalpels that are gonna be used. Again, I just make sure that they know what they're doing and that they're following directions. And if anyone were not to, well then they'd be, they'd be out. 
And I, fortunately, I have not ever had any issues. What's the most basic thing that is studied in physiology in your class? The simplest? Yeah. Um, probably the simplest would just be the, the um, review of the cells, because a lot of it is fairly complicated. When we study tissues, for example, they have to be able to recognize these different tissues under a microscope. Um, but the cuts, on, yeah, on a slide. Wow. That's very challenging. Most of the students have a hard time with that. They have to do it again and again. They have to practice. They have to come in on their own time if they really want to excel at it. Because if you don't practice looking at these tissues under a microscope, I mean, they're going to all look the same. I mean, I've, this is my third year teaching it. And I still am just starting to feel comfortable with a lot of these tissues. And so um, that's already challenging. I would have to say, though, also the skeletal system is probably one of the more simple because a lot of the kids know the bones. They remember for when they studied in elementary or high school. Um, and so that's probably one of the more simple of the systems that, we, that I teach. And so you'd say tissues would be the most difficult? It's one of the most difficult, definitely, tissues because it is so complicated. Um, not just that, it's really just <laughs> looking at this, the slides and not thinking, oh, that looks like red mush you know, and being able to differentiate the different tissues on the slides. However, right now, muscles is very hard too. Learning how a muscle contracts is very complicated. And the students today actually looked a little uh, flummoxed is the word, I believe. Just kind of like, oh my goodness. And it's pretty hard material. So I hear a lot of people say, take physiology in high school if you want to become a doctor. I totally understand that, but can you use it to become other things? Oh, certainly. Really, again, anything that has to do with the human body, certainly physiology would be great. I am students, I know students who not only want to become doctors, but they want to become um, like a physical therapist, or they want to become, they want to go into kinesiology, you know, some kind of sports, um, you know, I forgot what those are called, the, the sports guys on the side that help injured players, you know, all that kind of, so there's a lot of anything really to deal with the human body, any kind of field like that, physiology would be excellent for. And what do you recommend to students to stay organized? Because I think it's very important in your class to have it all together. Definitely. You definitely need to be organized. Time management is one of the greatest uh, skills that I believe a student can have. So yes, if they, I have a website. So if they keep an eye on the website and they know what's due. And again, looking over your work every night is huge. You need to look over what we did that day. You need to think, is there anything due? Um, if you don't look over your work and kind of check over your notes or the assignment you're working on, it doesn't stay in your long-term memory very easily. We don't want anybody cramming. If you study a little bit every night, it will get in your brain. You'll also know what you need to ask. You can come in the next, next day and say, hello, Mrs. Maurer, I'm not sure about this. And that's great. But if you leave it to the last minute and you're cramming, you can't ask me anything. The next day is a test. So I would say time management, learning and studying a slowly over time and not cramming, and always checking my website and looking at my whiteboard and asking questions when you have them. Oh, that is so amazing. I don't know how you keep that all together. Is there any last minute things you'd like people to know about your class? Well, basically that science is the way to go. <laughs> uh, science is practically in every field. And as I said earlier, jobs, you want some money? Go to science. Uh, and most of the fields that are in need are in science. So it's a great, it's a, it's a great thing to study. And even if you were never going to go, hey, it'll broaden your horizons. Gives you something to talk about. You know, so I love it. You should come take Mrs. Maurer's class if you have the opportunity to, and we'll have a great time. Oh, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. And thank you so much for joining us. And I hope to see you next time. And don't forget to like Elida's Curiosity Closet on Facebook. Thanks.